Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to, to today's Business Boosters webinar, Old School Selling in the Digital Era, sponsored by Field Routes. I'm PCT Senior Editor Jackie Mitchell, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Thanks for taking some time out of your schedule today to join us. Uh, we're going to be hearing from two speakers today who will discuss the pros and cons of door-to-door -door selling and digital marketing. Our speakers today are Mike Romney and Ryan Drury. Mike Romney started his door-to-door -door career with Eclipse Marketing and developed strong relationships in the pest management industry, including with Orkin. He eventually began his own marketing company in 2009, Romney Services. In his best month, Romney sold 305 accounts, his best day totaling 27 accounts. Shortly thereafter, Romney and Bryant White created their own brand, Fox Pest Control. The firm started with small offices in 2012. Since then, Fox Pest Control has grown to 31 offices from Midland, Texas to Boston, Massachusetts. Following their biggest summer ever, Fox jumped to the 15th largest pest control company in the nation with revenues nearing 70 million in 2020. At the end of 2021, Fox Pest Control boasted another record-breaking year with 95 million in revenue. Romney, his wife, and their six children live in Preston, Idaho, and love spending time with each other outdoors. They can often be found fishing, hiking, hunting, boating, and snowmobiling together. Ryan Drury is sales manager for the Field Route Sales and Marketing Suite. He is passionate about helping field service businesses understand the benefits of using effective online marketing tactics to help them reach their full sales growth potential. He started his sales career 10 years ago as a business development intern, and he graduated from Arizona State University in 2018 with his Bachelor of Arts in Business and Sustainability. In his spare time, he enjoys volunteering as a youth leader and at fundraising events. I have two quick notes to pass along before we get started. First, a disclaimer. The views expressed in presentations made during this virtual event are those of the speakers and not necessarily the PCT Media Group or GIE Media. Presentations during the virtual event or the participation of vendors during the virtual event does not constitute an endorsement of the vendor or speaker's views, products, or services. Uh, second, our webinar is interactive and we encourage everyone to ask their questions throughout. You can do that by typing them into the Q&A interface that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to hold your questions until the end of the webinar. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Mike. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you, PCT Business Boosters, um, for putting on this event and for Field Routes sponsoring it. Uh, Ryan, I'm looking forward to being with you and hearing from you in just a few minutes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here and, and, and to really just represent our company. Um, we're, we're grateful for all of the leaders in the industry over the years. We just believe in such a, a, a unification of collective intelligence with great leaders. And we've learned so much from um, so many of you on the call and friends in the industry that have just helped us grow and become uh, the people that we are. I uh, wanted to just give a brief introduction. Jackie did introduce a um, a few things about me, but I have uh, I live in Preston, Idaho. If you've ever seen the movie Napoleon Dynamite, that is where that's where I live, and it's not fully like that. It's a little bit more professional than Napoleon, but uh, but that's uh, we live in southern Idaho, and I have a wife, uh, my wife Nicole. We've been married for 23 years, and our oldest son just left to college, so it's me and my wife and our five girls that are at home, and we have a lot of fun. I'm just surrounded by great women in my life, and that just makes me better. Um, I've been in pest control. This is my 22nd year. Um, like Jackie said, I started it. I signed on with Eclipse Marketing in 1999 to go sell for Orkin. My first year I sold in Florida and loved the experience. It was a great opportunity to be able to uh, get to know an industry that I didn't know much about. And, and I sold in that industry for nine summers to get through school. I, um, I was going to school at a place called Rick's College in Rexburg, Idaho, and then transferred um, out to Connecticut and went to four years of school out there. So um, the, the hard part was, is I, I loved the industry, but I, I wanted to go into something totally different. So when I graduated school, I started um, a totally different company. 
but I also was making good money selling for Orkin. And at the time I could make close to a hundred thousand dollars a month selling door-to-door -door pest control. So I kept selling for a few years for Orkin. And then when the great recession happened in 2008, um, I, uh, the, the company I worked for Eclipse Marketing went out of business. And so uh, that kind of opened up and the, and the company that I also owned at the time um, wasn't making very much money. So that opened up an opportunity to come together with Orkin. And I started a marketing company, Romney Services Inc. in 2008. And um, also had my brother-in-law who we had known each other for quite a while. He'd been in pest control and we kind of got together and started that company. We marketed all over the, all over the nation and we've sold pest control in over 30 different states. Um, we did that for about four years. And in 2012, we decided to start our first locations, one in Connecticut and one in Midland, Texas. We really thought that that's all we would do. We thought we would might just have a couple companies and our values and goals were what was important to us is to provide a great living for people, to provide a great living for our families and to be able to serve in our church. And we thought that we could accomplish that with two branches. Um, but as our vision started to change and as we started to get into the industry a little bit more, um, we grew and now we're in 15 states with 31 different locations. We have two divisions in five regions and a little over 800 employees that are um, W-2 employees and we have about 500 sales reps. So our topic, which we're passionate and excited about is, is really uh, the old school of selling door to door versus the new school of selling in the digital era. And we do a lot of both. We're very strategic about how we use door to door and digital. The beauty of door-to-door -door is that when we go into a market in the spring, when we choose a market, and over the years we've we've gone into 31 markets, we'll go into the spring maybe in April and we'll have zero customers. But with the door-to-door -door presence, by the time the fall comes around, we'll have three to 4,000 reoccurring quarterly customers. Um, so that's really a two to $3 million business that we can create in a very short amount of time with door-to-door. -door. Um, one of the differences between door-to-door -door and digital is we haven't seen that advantage, that big of an advantage yet on that scale with digital. Um, we, we start digital right out of the gate, but we can't quite grow that fast. Then as a market matures in size and revenue over a few years, we really ramp up that digital as much as we can. And we really pull back on the door-to-door -door, or at least the door-to-door -door sales as a percentage of our total revenue. Um, last year as a company, um, we did $94.5 million in revenue. We spent $16.7 million on door-to-door. -door. So that's 17.6% of our revenue last year we spent growing our company through door-to-door. -door. We spent 7.9, or just let's just round it to $8 million on digital and inside sales, which is 8.4% of our revenue. Um, I reached out to Dan Gordon yesterday who um, runs PCO Bookkeepers, and, and he has uh, he's just one of the experts in the industry that writes for different magazines. And, and he said the average in our industry is about 7% that's spent on sales and marketing in a company. Um, if, companies, if a company is growing really quickly, they might spend 10 or 12 or maybe even 14%. But last year, we spent $24.7 million, which is 26% of our revenue on growth. And it's a fascinating number to, to, to think about um, spending that much of your revenue on growth. We weren't always that confident to spend that much revenue. As you go back 10 years ago, that would have been a really scary number for us. So the question comes to us is how much can you spend on door to door? How much can you spend on digital or on growth? And that really comes down to what is the light, how long can you keep a customer? What's the lifetime value of a customer? And we as uh, owners or experts or professionals in the industry really need to have a grasp on that because if we do know how long we can keep a customer, that's gonna really affect how much we can spend. When, if we just assume two things, that we're gonna be in a, a good demographic and we're gonna sell accounts in, in areas that have high income levels so the customers can afford what we're gonna sell them, we believe that the number one way to extend the lifetime value of a customer is through the culture of your company. That's the way that we found that you affect 
how long you keep a customer. So it's the most important foundational cor cornerstone is culture. And we wanted to spend just a second on that because we feel it's super important when we're talking about uh, spending a lot of money on growth. Um, our culture is developed because of our why. And our why really is that we believe in growing and developing people. Um, some people look at Fox Pest Control and call us a door-to-door -door pest control company. Others look at us and call us a traditional company that happens to use door-to-door -door and digital uh, marketing as, growth, as a growth venue. We look at ourselves at a, as a leadership development company with a relationship first, first based culture that happens to do pest control. And so everything rises and falls on culture and leadership. Culture and growing people is what we focus on. Pest control comes secondary. So we just believe in teaching and modeling our culture. If we don't create the culture, the culture will create itself. One of the things that as, as we've talked to people in our industry and other industries, when they talk about culture, they, they think that culture means things like good pay, good working hours, good benefits, good bonuses, good holiday pay and time off policy, good structure in an organization, a, a respectful boss, leaders that are respectful and good and orderly vertical accountability. And those things are important, but that's not really what we believe all of culture is. What culture really is, is that we're talking about values and principles and attributes that if we develop and we follow and we exemplify, then they make us good people and they make us great leaders. And so developing the character of the person is what creates culture. We have just three things we'd like to share about culture and then we're gonna move back into um, how much money we spend and how we grow with door-to-door -door and digital. The, the first thing that we found that's really important to create and develop culture and to, to develop leaders is what we call an individualized leadership plan, um, an ILP. An ILP really does a few things. It, it creates extreme loyalty. It, it welds them, it welds our employees and our team members to us in a natural and a normal way. You've heard the, the saying, well, we've got to create these golden handcuffs so somebody can't leave. We actually don't really prefer to say it that way, or, or, or we don't even prefer to look at it that way. We want somebody to stay with us in a natural and normal way because they love us and they like us and they want to fight for us. It's how that you get the best out of people and, it, and growing people through an individualized leadership plan will weld them to you with loyalty. It, it, it provides personal development and leadership success through for that individual team member. It creates a safe environment for them to ask feedback from you and for us to be able to give them feedback. And it brings value to their life, not just a paycheck. In an individualized leadership plan, everyone needs to have one in the company. We don't pretend that we're perfect at this because it's hard to get thousands of people, hundreds of people, an, an ILP, but, but the ILP or the individualized leadership plan is done by their direct report. And it covers things like, who are your mentors? Who are you personally following in your life? Who is in your inner circle? Who are the people that you look up to and that you go to on a regular basis to get feedback for your personal development and growth? What is your plan for personal growth? What is the short, mid, and long-term range process and outcome goals in your life? What leadership books are you reading and, and who, who are you leading and who's following you? It's a great question to ask. Somebody thinks they're a leader, well, let's just ask who's following you. And that's been a really important part of our company in developing our culture and developing our leaders. The second thing, um, I remember I was on an airplane and I had a book that had been um, uh, just given to me uh, by a guy named Tony Shea. He's recently passed away. He was uh, the owner of um, a great company. And the book is called Delivering Happiness. And in that book, um, he talked about a culture book. And in that book, I'm not so sure that we're aligned with all of the values that he presents, but we learned some great things from Tony. And so we ordered his culture book. We actually got it and read it. And, and so we just started, I think we're on our fourth or fifth year of our version of a culture book. Here's, here's a culture book from a couple of years ago, but it goes through and it, and it shows, it's got a section for every place in our company and it shows all of our core values and it teaches 
unifies, helps us recruit and helps us promote our view on culture inside and outside of our company. Um, and we've spent, uh, we have people that work part-time and full-time on this culture book year round. And I think last year, we probably don't even want to know how much it does cost. But um, I think we spent probably two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars a year on creating this culture book for for our company. Uh, the third thing that we think that is super important to create the culture of our company, and we have really um, we we kind of have to look at it. Um, we're unified as a company, but we we have a sales side and an operation side and a servicing side. And so we'll have annual leadership summits for those different organizations where we fly them out to different places. Last year, we spent over $700,000 to spend to bring uh, 300 leaders and their wives uh, to Hawaii for our annual leadership summit. And when we're there in Hawaii, we start at 6 a.m. and we try to provide world-class leadership training um, from 6 a.m. to noon. And then from noon, we have team building activities on the island where we're doing different activities and, and really just uh, getting to know each other better and building those relationships. And we're passionate about training and teaching these values. Um, we, we love to teach our team in fun places. It's a lot easier to teach leadership principles when you're in Hawaii than if you're in Logan, Utah, where we're at right now. And so uh, one year we might go to Cancun or we'll rotate different places that we go. And that's been an important part of the culture of Fox over the years. Um, so everything rises and falls on culture when it comes to keeping the customers. How long can we keep a customer? Because that determines how much we can spend. If we go back to 2012, um, in 2012, when we started in Connecticut and Midland, we had 42 sales reps. And we finished that summer in a four month period with 30. So you're going to have some attrition because it's hard. Now, 10 years later, as a company, we have, depending on the year, 450 to 600 sales reps. Um, in those first two markets in Connecticut and Midland, we sold that year. It's actually kind of fun to look back. It's almost a little bit embarrassing now, but we sold about 500 accounts in each market. Whereas today, if you add those two markets up, we'll sell door to door around 6,000 accounts a year. Um, if we look at this next slide, you can just see our, our growth as a company, at least from 2016. Um, just in revenue and the percentage of, of growth that, that we have grown over the years. And door-to-door and -door has been a huge part of that. Um, and we're going to talk about some of our strategy with digital as we've gotten stronger and stronger with digital. But how much does door-to-door -door cost? That's probably one of the biggest questions we get. In 2012, we spent 29% of our annual contract value per customer. And let me just tell you what that means we will sign somebody up for a one-year quarterly contract. So we're going to see them four times a year. If we charge them $100 a quarter, the annual value is $400. So we spent 29% of that all in on housing, sales reps commission, and recruiting in 2012. Well, over the years, that's gone up quite a bit. There's a lot more competition in the marketplace with door-to-door. -door, and we've spent anywhere between 45 to 68 percent of that contract value now. And let's just maybe break that down really quickly. Uh, of that 45 to 65 that we spend now, depending on the year, 11 percent of that is uh, recruiting and incentives. 78 percent is commissions. 10 percent of ha is housing and 1 percent goes to uh, goes to iPads. Um, so let's talk for just a second about some of the cons of door-to-door. -door. The purpose in talking about door-to-door -door is it's not to maybe have you go out and start a summer sales door-to-door -door program. Although you, if, you, if you want to, you're welcome to call us, call Bryant or I, we'd be happy to walk you through and, and maybe give you some pointers or, or, or help you do that. But some people that start a summer door-to-door -door program struggle or fail because, and sometimes even miserably, not because they're not smart or capable, but they underestimate the investment of time and effort and experience that it takes. Some door-to-door uh, -door companies, even guys that come from what we might call the door-to-door -door industry or a door-to-door -door company and know how to sell really well, 
um, they struggle or even, even sometimes fail because they grow too fast and they can't deliver a best in class servicing experience for the customer and their attrition rate is really high. So they really understand how to put customers on, but they're not paying to attention to how they're going to keep that customer. And their, their company, a company like that needs to slow their growth down, focus on the culture and focus on the operations of their company. It, it really takes a year-round full-time staff of professionals with experience in recruiting and training and motivating uh, uh, sales reps to go door-to-door -door and to have the program be successful. We've often seen people that think they're going to just go out and recruit from the local college and have guys go out door-to-door. -door. And, and if you just kind of throw it together, it's really difficult to do that. Our, our recruiters and our our 600 sales reps with their managers and leaders, that's all they do all year round is recruit and train and keep those guys and find new guys because you're, we're going to have the average door-to-door -door rep stays with us for about four years um, because they're in school for approximately four years. We have some that'll stay with us forever. Um, they need to be trained on how to approach someone as on a cold door. And the door approach is so critical. We don't have time to go through a door-to-door -door approach, but I just promise you that uh, if somebody just goes out and starts knocking doors and they don't have a little bit of training on how to approach someone cold at the door, it's gonna be really a struggle and they're gonna, they're gonna fail and they're gonna give up. Um, it is a big commitment and it seems a little bit risky because the cost, if you go out and get a marketing company in today's market, it's gonna cost you somewhere between 75 cents on the dollar to 90 cents on the dollar of the annual contract value. And the con is where are you gonna find somebody to market for you? Um, we, don't, we don't market for anybody else anymore. And there's not that many companies that do, so it's really difficult to find that. But let's talk about the pros of door-to-door -door for just a second. Um, it's 100% commission. What we love about door-to-door -door is we don't pay any money if we don't get the sale. And not only that is we're gonna, we're gonna scrub that account for about six months if that customer doesn't pay for a period of six months, then we don't pay the sales rep anything. It's very direct and targeted to specific neighborhoods. So we're gonna go into the neighborhoods where the income level is what we want, the demographics is what we want, the route density is really tight and where we wanna build our routes. So the, the efficiency and the profitability once you get those customers is really high. Um, there's lots of free advertising. We send out these good ladies and good young men and young women that are sharp looking and clean shaven and they, and they represent us well and they introduce Fox Pest Control and they hand out free flyers and, and we get a lot of people that call us later after that experience. And so we do get, um, we don't pay for everything we get. We also expand the market share of pest control. What's fascinating is most of the sales that we make uh, don't, don't wake up in the morning and say, I need to call a pest control company. They get, um, they get the idea introduced to them about why it would be a good thing to buy pest control. So we expand the, the market share of what we have. You look at California and Dallas, Texas, which are super competitive markets for door-to-door. -door. Uh, pest control is way bigger because of the door-to-door -door companies that are there. They've just increased that market share. Um, the other thing that's great is it's just another touch. We sell more accounts door-to-door -door year over year in our markets because people know us more. They got introduced last year and they didn't buy. Another person comes by the next year and they didn't buy, but the third year they'll buy. And so just as it increases the touch that we're going to have with people. So how would you get into door-to-door? -door? Here's probably our best advice on this. Um, we just believe in giving back. So if you want to get into door-to-door, -door, call us. We're, we, we're not going to charge you anything. We'll just help you. But our best advice is to Get as many leads as you possibly can through other sources and then send your best sales reps out to those leads to meet with those people. And when they sell that customer, then that sales rep needs to stay in that neighborhood and knock the whole neighborhood until dark. The reason why they need to go till dark is most people aren't home during the day. They'll be able to get sales during the day. But from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. is when you're going to make most your sales. But, but we promise you, if you'll get a good rep that will knock that neighborhood, he'll easily get two to five sales. A great rep will get 10 sales in that neighborhood. And so 
that's a really good way. The, the, the number one reason why people buy, the, the two most two and most important reasons why people buy, they buy because their neighbor did it and they buy because it's a good deal. So we have to equip that sales rep that's going out to the neighborhood to first of all, sell that customer because now he's got a neighbor that bought it. And we're going to use that name all day long in that neighborhood that the Romneys, they, they, want, they, they called us and wanted us to come out and get them taken care of. And we did them today. And my truck is here. That's the third reason why people buy is because it's urgent. You have to do everything same day. So we're going to equip that rep that goes out to that lead to learn how to do door-to-door -door in a warm way, not, not really a cold way. And, and we think that that creative way of selling would be a really impactful way that we've seen a lot of our friends grow their company and, and, and we have as well. Um, let's transition into talking a little bit about digiting, digital marketing. Some of our friends think that it's easier and less risky. And, and I actually would probably agree that the digital is a lot easier. Um, you don't have to go out and recruit some of these young guys that are a little bit entitled and they want to know how much money you're going to pay them. Um, we just get the phone to ring. And how great is that when the phone rings? The first time we started with digital, I mean, it was so fun for us because we're used to going and pounding the doors all day long to find the sales. And now they're coming to us. You have to be an expert in digital marketing or you have to hire an expert. That's just been our experience. You have to stay in it for the long haul because it doesn't all come really quickly at once. Um, so we try to find people that are best in class in their specialty and keep them in their strength zones. And that goes with everything in our company. We try to keep our operations really in their strength zone and keep our marketing team in their strength zone and keep our sales guys in their strength zone. Um, so on inside sales and digital revenue, what, what we call inside sales is, is we, have, um, we have a team of about 60 people right now that we call inside sales, and they, they take all the inbound calls from people that want our service. And we'll talk in a second about all the different ways that we get people to, to call us. But this shows our revenue growth on, dig, on the digital side. You can see, and it's been very intentional over the years, we love door-to-door -door and we're always going to do a portion of door-to-door, -door, but we said, how do we grow our, our digital side to, to match our door-to-door? -door? And that's what we're trying to do because as a, as a, as like Connecticut now and Midland is 10 years old, we've got a really great base. And so we want to grow um, our inside sales and our digital marketing to be as high as that door-to-door. -door. Um, so here's, this is a fascinating slide if you can see it on your screen. In 2017, we did $10. million of sales in door-to-door -door and only half a million dollars in sales on our digital marketing. So we started to want to push that as hard as we could, and it took us a while to figure it out. We did $11.2 million in 2018 and now $1.7. Um, so, we, gosh, we more than tripled in, in, in that year in the internet marketing side of things. Then you see in 2019, $16.7 million on the door-to-door -door side. Then we just, we really, um, our, our guy that works for us and we have a, a great in-house team and we also hire people on the outside as well, just started kicking butt in 2019. You look in, in 2020, we did 35 million. We did grow a ton in door-to-door, -door, but we also did just shy of 20 million on the, in the digital side. And now in 2021, just last year, we did 36 million in door-to-door, -door, kind of an intentional, we're, we're growing there a little bit, but, but we're kind of... Um, um, doing that on purpose so we can put so much money, money, money and effort into digital marketing. Um, this is a, a fun slide to just see how many leads we got on the digital side. In 2015, we got 8,000 leads. I'm not going to go through year by year, but you can see last year we got 48,000 leads from digital sources. We actually got... Um, we received 73,434 phone calls last year of real people who contacted us that wanted to buy our service. And the vast majority of those were phone calls. There was a few um, that were contacts of, you know, they're, they're coming through uh, some other internet source where we, where we type, uh, what do you call it? Where we, we type it out and, and, and respond to them. Um, here's something that we've learned that and, and we have friends that are kind of 50-50 on this, but we used to, every phone call we got, we used to send it out 
to the, to the local technician or the local salesman and have them drive to the home and pitch them in person. And we really thought that that was the way to go. We, we, we loved it. We, we had an amazingly high closure rate. But what we found was that we, could, we were actually missing people because we're, we believe that people are starting to change and, and the, serve, the way that people want to be served is a little bit different. Although face-to-face is so critical and important, we just found now that people, when they call, they want to know right there on the phone what it's going to cost, what it entails. And if we don't give them some of that, we feel that we're missing a lot of sales. And so now every, every call that comes in comes to a live salesman on the phone and they will sell them on the phone. Um, with a caveat that we need to go out there with a technician and do an inspection. And, and if they need to make an adjustment or need to do something different that we will, um, the world is just changing and we need to keep up. There's a faster approach and people want things quick and they want it now. We're even seeing an increase in, in people wanting to buy through texting or online chatting. So digital marketing door to door has been around forever but it has changed a ton in the last 30 years. And in the 22 years I've been in, there's been more change in the last six years in door-to-door than we've ever seen in the last 22. We've been in digital marketing for only 10, but we've seen so much change in the last three years as we have in the last 10 years. And that's one of the hardest things is that the competition in both digital and door-to-door is getting harder and it drives up that cost. It used to be that digital was so much, was way cheaper. And now we find that um, the digital and door-to-door can rival, especially if you're being competitive. So this is is a great slide to show just on the digital of those 48,000 people last year. These are the different um, ways that we got our accounts. Uh, Through our Fox website, we got 4,200 accounts. Through lead vendors, we got 13,000. Through Yelp, 279. Facebook, 194. Um, email and direct marketing, not that many, about 150, 160. Um, Google My Business, 8,700. Google Organic or SEO, 5,000. Um, Google LSA, 3,800. Google Ads, uh, t- almost 12,000. 12, so this kind of leads us to talk a- a- about kind of the next point we, we just wanted to share is that we believe um, you don't want to have all of your sources in one basket. You really want to be well, well diverse and you want to have some type of a digital and internet president presence. You want to have a social media presence. You need to have an email presence and a, ma- a direct mailer presence, a door to door, some type of a door to door presence, um, some type of a technician sales program, some type of a creative sales program on the ground where people are going out and, and getting creative and selling. Um, we, we love to hire professionals in their industry. I mentioned earlier that we have our own in-house team and they're awesome. We, we hope and think that they're second to none on the digital side, but they are in charge of also reaching out and we have multiple relationships with other agencies and firms that also get, get us leads. And our, our team is in charge of finding those companies, finding good ones. Um, looking at how much the spend will be, setting budgets for that and, and managing and controlling that. So we just believe in, in specialists and professionals that work for us that get us these leads. Um, in closing, we would just say how much we believe in the principle of abundance, that the more you give, um, the more that we've, we've reached out and given, the more we've received. We've always felt like we got back more when we went to visit people. We've been so grateful. We have a culture of visiting other companies and learning from them. And that's probably helped us grow and refine and, and tweak and, and become better more than anything else. And so we're just grateful for those companies all across the country that we talk to. Uh, it seems a little bit more virtually lately but that we visited, that we fly out. And, um, and we just think that that's an important part to do. And our, our industry is small and um, it's a small world out there. And so we have a lot more to gain in the collective intelligence and sharing and being a part of that. So we would just invite you at any time, if you ever wanna call Bryant or I and, and have any questions about what we do on the digital side or what we do on the door to door, we would welcome that and be happy to give back in any way we can because we've just been the benef- beneficiaries of so many people helping us in the industry. So I hope what we, uh, what we just presented was, was helpful in some way. We're, 
we're grateful to be in this industry. And um, it was an honor to be able to be with you guys for a few minutes. The only thing I wish was different. I wish we could be in the same room and, and have a little bit more give and take. But uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, uh, PCT. And thank you, Ryan and Field Routes for putting this together. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, and now we're going to hear from Ryan Drury of Field Routes. Mike, first thing, I mean, amazing. It's the information you're able to give and being fully transparent. I mean, I was uh, just blown away. It's hard to follow up for sure. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. It's good to be on with you. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Absolutely. So I wanted to quickly, I, I put together a small PowerPoint for you guys going over just out the gate what are we seeing with um the, the idea of the old school and new school and what that all lays out and so i'm going to pull that up really quick but i want to spend a majority of the time that i have with you guys going over something that is um really near and dear to our hearts over here at field routes and that is going to be um this consumer report we put together so i am just going to for whatever reason it's not allowing me to pull it up Oh, stand by. Here it is. Awesome. Cool. Let me share my screen for you guys really quick. Let me go over that. Okay. And so I really liked a lot of what Mike was saying earlier. I think something that really works for us on our end is starting with why. And for those on the call who may have known that Simon Sinek is, is great. His amazing TED Talks, his book's amazing. Um, and when we look at what really differentiates people in the marketplace from being talking to someone in person, like we get to with Mike here, or seeing somebody's online presence online, um, the main differential is what is their company culture? And it's really easy to see those things when you're looking at it online. Cool. So from what we've seen, I was doing this again um, you know, for around 20 years, over here on the federal routes marketing side, you know, we were in the past lobster marketing and one of our uh, main components was helping focus on the pest control industry. Uh, we made that switch to line up with pest routes then, and then rebrand rebrand with field routes in this past year. Um, we continue to maintain that culture on our side. You know, we really want to help uh, companies be that community leader in the space, um, be it within pest control and, and, and lawn care. And then hopefully, um, any ad additional adjacent verticals out there in the space, we want to make sure that you guys can tell your story in the best way possible. We want to be the megaphone. So what we found with that old school in person, you have a lot of control in being able to have a high impact with talking to the prospect, sharing your personal story, aligning with them in every step of the way, um, and, and really delighting them across that process. And so we want to continue to maintain that when you're looking to, um, increase your online presence. You, you wanna make sure that you're reaching clients in the same way um, you, you were in face-to-face. -face. When that acquisition goes down, that you're, you're having a higher conversion rate. And I know Mike went over some numbers and I think it's really important to be data-driven. And then another portion of that too, and he said not being able to pay out for folks with door-to-door -door if the client churned or, or was a clawback, retention's important. And that retention with a client and that attention to detail leads to their further loyalty, the reviews online, and for you guys to have a lot more, um, a lot more impact with those who are in your immediate vicinity. So we found again that being able to communicate online, making sure that full life cycle of the client is really aligned with what's in the space. Amazon, DoorDash, Carvana, we all across all demographics make a lot of decisions based and influenced by things that we see online. And so it's important to extend your reach in a way that is very much aligned with your company's culture and values. Um, and I think Mike has really good examples of, of how he was able to do that for his firm. So cool. Now that was brief because I wanted to get really into to this portion here, which is going to be um, our consumer report. This will be available to whoever wants to have access to it after the end of the call. But really wanted to look at the industry overall um, when it comes to folks making decisions on um, home services. And so we'll stick with pests because I know that's the, the meat and potatoes here. But in the last month or the last 12 months, we saw that 58% of people who are making searches online are involved themselves with pest control search 
and that at any given time, around 43% of those who are both in the homeowner and renter market have either purchased pest control or are proactively looking um, to the future to make a decision um, based on what's going to be best for them. And so I think Mike nailed it on the head, right? At any, at any given time, when you look at why a client's going to make a decision, uh, he brought up the, the example of a neighbor, right? We call that social proofing. So when you have a client or a, or a potential client, you're in our process online, we can show you guys at a later date, um, process online is really lining in that social selling aspect. How many neighbors in your area are utilizing the service and just feeling very comfortable making a decision. And then also the good value record there um, and the importance on urgency. So I think this next portion of this report really dials that in too. So why are customers making a switch? You see 63% of them are on a reoccurring plan pretty much par for the course, right? We think about all the recurring subscription plans we're on from, uh, from Costco to, to Netflix or whatever it is. If we're happy with something, we wanna be and have it be ease of use, you know, not have to worry about, um, make sure we don't miss any payments. Um, and again, amongst those who are purchasing or have purchased pest control services in the last 12 months, they're pretty satisfied, right? Six out of 10 say they're satisfied, especially those in the urban area. But if that's the case, despite the high satisfaction, why would people want to make a decision to make a change? And we see that across the board, 46% of respondents in our survey were likely to switch companies. And this might suggest there's a, lo a loyalty issue, but rather they're going to make a decision on a couple things. So going right back to Mike's point earlier, right? Good value, right? They want to see if they're going to find a better deal out there in the marketplace. And a lot of things influence decision-making. So it's not just the perceived value, but it's how you're being treated. Right, we see 45% of those are looking for a really good customer service experience. And then 48% are looking to maybe try something new. So we found that those in the marketplace, um, a younger generation, they're willing to try something new around 63, 61% of the, those are looking to try something new versus those who are incumbent or loyalty customers. Um, we see a lot of this in the, in the urban and suburban areas and those with the higher income are willing to make changes which for a lot of us, I wanna make sure when we're looking to push our business online that we're just lining up with a customer who can afford our services, not you know, discriminating against anybody across the board, but just make sure that we're, we're lining up with people who are gonna be long-term a, a good decision for our company. So when it comes to when they're looking to make a decision, the number one reason why they pull the trigger across the board is just gonna be that um, seeing an active infestation. So initial triggers would be the infestation, 51%. So you see a need, fill a need. And so instead of folks saying, hey, well, I want to spend a lot of money, time, energy um, cultivating my social media, um, we want to make sure that we're looking for online presence. I think going right back to why door-to-door -door is so successful is because you can see a clear ROI. We want to make sure we're doing that the same thing online as well. And so when we're pulling the trigger on different pieces of data and content here on the federal marketing side, it's all being dialed around return on investment. So you see around over 50% of type of active searches are being based around general pests and extermination of rodent control, which again are very huge drivers because their infestation is very visual. I see, I need to make a decision. And so instead of scrolling through my Facebook, um, I'm searching my phone, you know, best way to ant proof my home near me or best pest near me, those type of local searches with appropriate content online, you know, dialed in with the rest of your marketing approach, you can really answer the, the questions the customer is looking for. Okay, cool. So we're about halfway through on the report and I'm not going to get onto the nitty gritty here, but I want to show you guys some major takeaways that we see in demographics. So when we look at this, it's pretty, pretty similar across the board of the different different graphic pieces but some of the elements that were, were really stand out to me is when you're looking for um, those who are making a decision, you know, print, right? Net new still has a place, 7%. But that when you look into um, communicate with folks that across the board, they're looking to call family, friends, neighbors for additional advice. And that influences their decision making. But that net new across the board, digital is going to be the best way to grow your business. And when you're looking to drive clients in that way, it's coming from a different, a couple different avenues. So right off the bat, most searches are going to come from the general internet search. So I'm going to go into my browser, be it Google or Bing, and I'm going to make a search like pest control near me. 
Now we're also going to align and dial in with that social selling friends and family recommendations. There's a lot of young families out there who are looking in the space and they're going on to online review sites, right? Like Yelp, like Google, my business. Um, and the social media is there as well. But what we're seeing is that most often than not is at first to their eyeballs, when they can see you and help influence decision-making, you're following best practice from Google's point of view. You're giving the information the customer is looking for and the search engine, and that's gonna help you have a higher conversion of clients. So we found 77% is Google is gonna be making that um, decision that's gonna be the biggest impact on them is what they're able to find very quickly doing a Google search. And these other elements, Yelp, Facebook, Home Advisor, they're very good in supplementing how you guys grow your business. But we want to make sure that we're focusing a lion's share of our resources towards what's going to have the highest ROI. Cool. So I think going right back to what Mike said at the very beginning of, of, his, uh, of his talk time was having a great culture is going to separate you from your competition. And so repability, I'm sure Mike could talk about that for, for another 30 minutes or an hour, why this works versus that. Um, a lot of times just having what your core values are and standing by those. And so time and again, they can find that social proof through Google reviews, through Better, Better Business Bureau, maybe seeing your trucks in the area for 30 years. Um, there's a, a variety of ways that influences that. But then the second point, again, right up with repability is going to be, is this a good value? Is this price point fit within my budget? And can I make a decision on this? And then looking at reviews from customers, it, the urgency of you guys being able to come out same day influences decision-making as well. Cool. So what's different between the owners and the renters? The big one out of the, out of the gate was there's a higher propensity for those who are renting to focus more on a budget solution. And then those who are owning to find the best solution um, regardless of price. So we saw earlier, they're very much neck and neck, but that they're looking for those things more than they are looking for a deal. You can see right here, 27% of folks, both owner, owners and renters are looking for a deal promotion, but, but that's actually you know below the top five reasons why they're gonna make a decision. Now, this statistic is really interesting to me based on just the, um, the topic uh, that we're discussing today is when you look at entry and new market, door knocking and getting out there and really driving, grabbing market share, it's going to be the most controllable method of doing that. But with long-term and mid-term growth projections and where you are and even be able to compete with those at your local level, door-to-door um, -door is taking a smaller and smaller position within that just because not a lot of people um, want to answer the door anymore. And so with focusing on having a good reputable brand online, being able to, to close over the phone, and have information on your website that answers the questions clients are looking for is that when they call you and they're looking to make a decision, 48% of them are calling a company that they've already seen, experienced, be it maybe be it door knocking, maybe seeing a truck, maybe seeing a, a flyer or doing a Google search. They're calling somebody that they've seen or known before. And that increasingly, which hasn't existed in, until the past three years, is the ability to even book services online. And so that's something that we'd love to talk to you guys about. Um, if you want to sit down with us for a demonstration is the affiliate network that we've built over here at Phil Routes, which allows for you guys to monetize strict traffic to your website and, and also make sure you're not losing out on any leads that you guys can service from those who are also in network. So this affiliate marketing piece is really huge because we're seeing that increasingly more and more clients of ours are uh, the C2 customer, that end user. They are just across the board with Amazon, DoorDash, Carvana, whatever it might be. They're booking services online because that's just what they do for every other industry. And so these other demographics information is going to be going over decision making processes based on um, really the nitty gritty stuff, price point, ability to come when I need them to come, sense of reliability and trust. And we'll be able to provide the support for all of you guys on this call. So you have it to, to really dive into these details. Um, but I want to keep it very high level. Awesome. Cool. So something that we found to be you know, very interesting is that when you're looking at the demographics 18 to 34, and then those are 35 and above, that testimonials that are validated on the company's website, for those in the older demographic were very, very, very important. 
when you look at reviews from clients that had a similar problem, that both with the both demographics we're talking about here, that that was really important to them. So the testimonials are great to have on your site and it's really good for your team when you're looking to build really good reps and potentially leaders on, the, on your organization, that having and writing down the testimonials from the clients important to have for proofing out your business, but just being able to have people leave a review. So something that we're working on over here on field routes is being able to tip a technician. So for every five-star review you guys get, and it's an honest, great feedback, it's really good for the, to the technicians. So you're able to provide them an added incentive with like a monetary tip or enter them into a competition to win, win a, a trip to Hawaii or something like that to get the most reviews. But that influences decision-making more so than these other components. And I think a lot of the time, nine months out of 10, what we're finding is that's because it's very convenient to read 10 reviews really quickly and say, yeah, I made a general feeling about what this company is versus having to read a bunch of testimonials. It's just ease of access. Awesome. And so we looked earlier at why are, why are companies or why are customers leaving companies that they were happy with to go to someone else? Um, it could possibly be that they're looking for a full range of services. So I know we talked about that over 50% is including general pests, ants, and rodents. There's also a massive block around 13% of searches and, um, and customers booking online are coming from mosquito, termite, right? These are, these are things that with you doing these as a business, you also need to make sure that your online presence is showcasing this. It could even come in the form of upselling them on an email campaign, but that you're actually listening to the client and to what their needs are and providing a solution that you guys probably provide. Maybe you don't discuss with them. And that's going to be really valuable for them. In addition, right, being very friendly, being customer focused and responding very quickly, again, gives them that ease, that feeling that they're being heard and listened to and that they made the right decision and bet on the right horse. Somebody who's going to provide the service that they um, and their family need to feel safe. So another circle back around with the preferences of purchase, phone sales are so, so important. I know it's tough to get in front of a person. It's, just, it's tough to get face-to-face -face nowadays with COVID, but being able to have the interaction on the phone, you're really influencing the customer in a way where they're getting all of the things we just discussed. The friendly, friendly responses, quick answers, and that you're providing the full range of services. But that also, when we look at the future, increasingly, um, the website and then being able to buy online is going to be a really strong component of your, your growth for your business. Because frankly, across the board, um, uh, the C2 customer has all the power, their fingertips to do the research to determine, hey, this company has done this for that long. Here's different blogs or location pages that I've read about online that really exude confidence to me as an end user that they know what they're talking about and they're the best source for me. And so it may not be the case that that is, but every single, every single person on this, on this call today, you guys can walk away with knowledge saying, Hey, is my online presence exuding true confidence into what we're doing as an organization? And can we realign with making sure that we're providing that information over the phone and even on our, on our company website, because that's going to be the lion's share of how we grow our business in the long term. So I think just in summation, I want to just go over back to um, what Michael's circling around with and, and just the overall market we're seeing here is that there's both a place for having high impact um, in-person interactions and that maintaining a strong online presence, not just online marketing, but having a strong online presence can help influence and retain clients that you need. So you can have that market share to get to wherever it is you guys need to get to, whatever the end goal is across the board for you guys. All right, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, we are going to take some questions from the attendees now. Um, We've had a lot coming in during the presentations. Um, so this first one uh, is for Mike. How many door-to-door -door salespersons do you employ and how easy is it for you to obtain them? Yeah, that's a great question. It just depends on the year. I think I mentioned we started with 42 our first year and I think we've had as high as 600 in our best year. And, and so, you know, between five and 600 is what we have right now. And we never really fully know until we start the summer with, with college kids and their, and their plans can change on a dime, but uh, it's, it is 
that is probably the hardest, the two hardest things about door to door is, is number one, teaching them how to sell on a cold call basis and teaching them to deal with the rejection. And, and, but the number one thing is getting that sales rep and finding the right one. Cause you can talk people into coming and selling for you that just don't fit the right, they don't have the right personality for it and the right character traits. And that's the hardest to find. And so getting good at that and, and, and really weeding out ones that are, aren't going to be good sales reps or they don't have the work ethic. And that's just hard to find in, in 22 years that I've been in the industry, it's changed a lot um, in the generations that we're seeing now coming up, wanting to work and willing to work. So it's hard to find them. It's really hard. And the competition is really steep, but there's more and more companies that do door to door. So um you're competing for the same guy with, with way more companies. When I started, there was like one company, maybe two that did it. And now there's probably, oh, I don't know, maybe 75 major companies that do door to door. All right. Thanks. Um, another question, if possible, would you talk about what percentage you pay in commission? Uh, to a sales, to a door to door sales rep. Is that, is that what we just, I'm yes, assuming I believe that. so. Yeah. Okay. You know, that's a really good question. And, and we're, um, we're pretty open with that, actually. Um, and you have to be competitive in our market today. But a first year rep is different than an experienced rep, and, and maybe even different than a big hitter. We have sales reps that'll sell over a 1000 in a summer. And those sales reps are going to make $500,000 in four months. So that's the high end, right? And and a first year rep, an average first year rep is going to make between twenty to $30,000 in a summer. And an average first year rep will sell around 150 accounts in the industry. That's kind of industry standard. And so you're going to start them off somewhere in the middle of the 25% range, and they're going to work their way up a pay scale that's retroactive. And we'd be happy to share that with people if they would like it, uh, just what that would look like and how much you might pay a sales rep and what you'd need to do in order to be competitive. But retroactive means as soon as they hit 100 sales, they're going to get a higher commission rate on all their prior sales. When they hit 150, boom, they they kind of move up the rungs of that pay scale. So I think that probably hopefully that answers their question. Okay, and um, this one's kind of related. Uh, you said that D to D is a hundred percent commission, but what other costs do you incur each month with each salesperson? Yeah, so we we you know we talked about recruiting expenses, right? And I think just all in this year, we spent thirteen million dollars on sales commissions. We spent two point seven million dollars on recruiting. Uh, we spent two million dollars on housing and a couple hundred thousand on iPads. And that's probably the best breakdown I can give you, but you are going to have some housing expenses. Now, in, in the contract that, that you have with a sales rep, they are responsible to pay for their housing unless they hit a certain number of accounts. So if they sell 150 accounts, congratulations, we will pay for your housing. So you're going to incur that cost, but they've got to hit a certain number of accounts. Recruiting is expensive. So you've got to you're going to be going on recruiting trips. You're going to be going on dinners. You're going to be going on leadership summit trips. I, I mean, we in that $2.7 million is like, uh, I think it was, if my memory serves me right, this last year, it was over 800000 that we spent to bring our, our sales reps and their wives to Hawaii. So it's expensive. Um, but that can kind of give you a, enough an idea on the breakdown. Thanks. Um, here's another question. As a startup company, does it make sense to get a loan, a loan to fund a door-to-door -door team right off the bat with how competitive commission rates are? How would you go about starting a company with little capital in this market? Oh, that is a great question. Um, it just That's such a good question. It depends on how much experience you have in the industry and how confident you are and you're going to keep those customers. If you're going to get a loan and hire a, a, a third party, um, to do marketing for you, call me before you do. <laughs> because, because the challenge is, is you have to be so careful on the onboarding process. And, and this, is, this goes on any, this is something that we work on and we talk about with our operations team uh, all the time, weekly, is how are we onboarding that customer and what is the experience that they're having and how is the communication from the sales rep, whether it's on the phone or on the door, to what we're actually going to provide. And that's where we find if we're going to drop the ball, that's the first place and the biggest place where we drop the ball. It would shock you. It shocks me to know that when people call to cancel our service, 
One of the main reasons they call is because they just didn't understand. They didn't understand that we'll come out for free between the services. And I'm like, how did that miscommunication happen between the sales and the service and all the welcome calls we do? So that onboarding of the process is so important. I, I probably would not recommend getting a loan to start up. Um, and we just eased into it as we could afford it. So that's my advice. But that comes from me uh, being maybe a little bit more conservative. Okay, um, going back uh, to talking about commission, um, one of our attendees says, thanks for your transparency. When you say retro, do reps start over next summer or do they stay at that commission rate for their career? Yeah, good question. In the competitive field right now, and, and, and it just makes sense that we want to get that rep back. And, and so we're going to start them at the same um, commission that they left off last year for the most part, um, as long as, you know, they're a reputable rep and they've got, they're doing good things and they're following our values and who we are. That, that's kind of an advantage just in the industry in general. That's usually uh, kind of what happens is they get to start at their commission rate from last year. All right, um, Mike, this is a question from your revenue comparison chart. Um, can you talk about the breakdown of spend versus growth? Well, let's see. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I don't have the chart right now here with me, Roy, could you see if you could find that? But I, I'm not really sure exactly what they're asking, the breakdown of spend versus growth. But, but, but I could go back to this. Let me just maybe answer that question this way. Um, we... We spent, I mean, we grew 36% from 2020 to 2021. I think we went from 69 million to 95 million. Um, we spent in the year 2021 to grow $24.7 million in sales and marketing expenses. And that's all in, right? That's sales reps commissions. Um, that's how much we're paying Google. That's how much we're paying housing for door-to-door -door reps and recruiting and all of that. So we did spend 24.7 million in order to grow that year. Um, and those percentages are again on the on the internet side or digital leads, it's 8.4% of our revenue and 16.7 million we spent on the door to door side, that's 17.6% of our revenue. I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Um, how many of your leads did you convert to customers in 2021? Yeah, so, um, uh, I'm assuming that's on the digital side, right? On a door-to-door -door side, it depends on the rep, but for every 10 doors you knock, you're probably going to sell one. Some reps are every 20 doors that you talk to somebody, the actual decision maker. So it's one in 10 or one in 20, depending on the experience of a rep. On those lead calls, those 73,000 calls that we had come in, um, we have to break it down. We obviously want reoccurring revenue. We call it a home protection plan. So a quarterly reoccurring revenue service. Now we actually sell two-year contracts rather than one. Um, so we're, we're trying, we're keeping that, you know, having that customer stay a little bit longer right up front, but um, we're selling somewhere between 60 to 70% um, on an H, what a reoccurring um, program. And then we are still selling another 10 out of that chunk. Then there's another 10 or 15% on a one-time service. So sometimes we get bed bugs. Sometimes we get some termites and some other different things in there, but we're really closing about 80, 80 to, to mid eighties on everything that comes in of, of source closing on something. Okay. Uh, we got a couple questions about lead vendors. First, can you explain what lead vendors are? And then can you go into more detail on what companies you use for lead vendors? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, we were careful and, and, and this is just, let's just maybe step back and take this a little bit broader, maybe um, is that we've had some amazing lead vendors and we've had some that we just had no luck with. And, and some that my friends have had luck with, we just haven't had luck with. So you have to experiment and try. Um, and we have several, I would say, that are in the bucket right now that we're not, we wouldn't refer them or reference them because we just don't know yet. And then we have a few that we've had some really good luck with. And then we have our own in-house. In and so um, if, if somebody really wants to reach out and call me, I might in a private conversation be able to talk to them about where they're at and what they're looking for. But I probably would just leave it at that. Thank you. How do you deal with no soliciting neighborhoods? 
Yeah, that's a tough one. And it's something that you see. Um, there's been all kinds of even stuff of what's constitutional and what's not and arguments and lawsuits and, um, you know, what the Constitution says you can and can't do. We just believe that um, the, the, the Constitution is in our favor and on our side. But we have to be respectful. You'll, you'll knock neighborhoods that will have a no soliciting door, right? And um, so you just want to be respectful of people's time. You can leave flyers. You just want to be careful about that. There are no soliciting neighborhoods where we just have to be careful and kind of respect that. It's difficult. Um, Florida is one of those where you have gated neighborhoods where you just can't get in. And man, I'll tell you, if we could get in, we'd sell a lot because nobody knocks those doors. And someone else also asked about HOA neighborhoods and what to do if you're in those. I'm assuming that's the same type of situation. Very similar. Yeah. Um, um, you just want to be respectful, right? You treat people how they'd want to be treated. But but we find in a lot of cases, we have a lot of customers in those neighborhoods. So sometimes you can go visit that customer, see how they're doing. And, and you can re sometimes reach out and ask for referrals and knock some of the neighbors very carefully and respectfully. And um the best thing is if you can get a hold of the homeowners association and sell that guy and he likes you, then you've got an in and, and that's worked on, in a few cases. We It's, it's so important. Th this is uh, one of the problems with some, uh, I'll just be real. There's some problems with some door-to-door -door companies that don't get permits. And it's just, you have to get solicitors permits. You need to follow the law and do that. We spent, oh, I don't know the numbers last year, but I know in some years we spent between thirty dollars to $50,000 getting solicitors permits across the country for our reps. And it's just worth it. You want to you wanna call the police departments the day before and say, hey, just want you to know we're going out to this city. We've got our permits. We're going to be out there. You'll probably get calls because that's what happens. You get a, just a few people that don't really don't like it. But the vast majority, even through COVID, the vast majority of people were happy to see us it's just those one-offs and two-offs those five percent of people that they're just grumpy about everything so get your solicitors permits pay the money be respectful let the police know what you're doing and um you're you'll just be a lot better off the reputation will follow you and we've worked really hard over the years so there's a great reputation with fox and if you don't do those things we just talked about the reputation the reputation will also follow you for not, not being a team player and following the law. Do you have any advice for doing door-to-door -door in large cities such as New York City? Oh, that, that's a tough one. You know, um, I mean, New York City is technically in our territory, but we don't knock doors there. It's really hard. Um, I mean, I suppose you could go commercial door to door, but in the city with those high rises, I'm not really sure how you do it. If you're going to get out in Queens and a little bit more out there, then it's possible. Um, obviously, outside of the city in the suburbs is where you're going to have success door to door, um, unless you wanted to go commercial. Um, have doorbell cameras like Ring changed the door to door sales game at all? A little bit, you know, um, I mean, it's it's been commented on before that, you know, that it, 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 is it harder to do door to door because people don't like that. And I, I'm the first to admit, I, I don't I mean, I have empathy for a door to door salesman, but I don't love it when somebody knocks on my door. And so that's part of the hard, hard thing about door to door is you're going to get rejection. You're going to get people that are home that can see you on the door to door camera that just aren't going to answer. And it is just it's a numbers game with door to door. And you got to knock enough doors to find the people that are going to buy. And we like to say, look, if you'll just go out and work eight hours, literally eight hours knocking doors, you're going to find one or two sales a day that are just gimmies. They're like, oh, I can't believe you're here. We were just talking about getting something because we have ants in the kitchen. So you just got to knock enough doors to find that person. And so if there's somebody that has a camera that's listening or watching you and you don't even know that and they're like, oh, another door-to-door -door guy or whatever he's saying, you just got to leave and go to the next one. Uh, can you go over what the average cost per lead was for digital? Yeah, and um, that has fluctuated over the years. It's between 70 to $100, right? It has gone up. It used to be years ago where we were more like 25 to $45 a lead. And that was amazing. And now it's 70 to 100, depending on. And, and here's the problem with the cost per lead. Where, where is it just the cost per click? Is it the cost per phone calls that come in? Or is it the cost that you're actually closing the leads? 
So where does that go? I, I think last year we were at $70.12, but the prior year we were at $100.80. It also varies drastically by market, depending on the competition of the market. Um, so just how many companies are advertising and we've seen a huge increase when we started digital 10 years ago i did not realize the steal of a deal we were getting because nobody was doing it now everybody's doing it so the costs are just going up uh quite a bit okay and i think this question is also um has to do with leads it says you're very targeted in your approach where do you get your demographic information? A lot of that, um, I mean, there's citydata.com or city-data.com and different websites. You can get some information and look at average household incomes um, and, and different demographics there. And then a lot of it's just experience. One of the blessings that we didn't realize is we had knocked um, in 30 different states across the country for Orkin, which is a nationwide company. We just got an education, right? of where to sell and where not to sell and what the attrition rates were. And so doing that for like 15 years um, and tracking the, the retention in neighborhoods across the country and in different cities really gave us um, some great data. So a lot of it even is now almost intuitive, but you're really just looking for high income areas where you're confident that uh, people are going to pay their bills. And there's a lot of two people are busy. They don't want to mess with pest control or lawn care. They want to just have somebody do it. So that's kind of where we look for. Okay, um, another attendee said, we want to recapture clients that have purchased previous client homes. Is door-to-door -door the best approach? How would you role play this? You repeat it really quick again. Sure, it says, uh, we want to recapture clients that have purchased previ previous clients' homes. Is door-to-door -door the best approach? How would you role play this? Yeah, that's a good, um, so we, we've tried this through a few different ways, through letters, but, but um, visiting the home is, I believe, is, I mean, how do you, sometimes you can't even get their phone numbers, right? But visiting the home and saying, hey, miss, uh, so nice to meet you. I, this is a, I, I, would, I would just love to do this all day long because it's just in our blood, right? Um, and, and, and if you can somehow get their name, hey, Mr. Johnson, I know you just moved in. We actually have treated this home the last four years. And... Um, and we specialize in this neighborhood. We actually have, we're, we're, whatever the pitch is, right? We, have, we do the Romneys and we do the Jensen's and we do the Millers. We do so many homes in your neighborhood and I'm the route manager for your area. We would like to just pick up the service where you left off. And so um, what we would do to get you started, we'll just go ahead and get your home treated today. We'll do the first service for free. And then we just put you on the regular schedule that we've always done on your home because we know this home, let's just get you in. So whatever it takes to get that customer, right? Now, all of a sudden, you might pay somebody a little bit of commission to get that. But if you got to give them that first service for free to get it or, or a discounted rate, and maybe you don't need to do that. You don't always need to. But whatever it takes to get that customer um, would be really fun to go out and get them. So I would do that in person. Okay. Um, how long before you see an ROI for a given salesperson? Um. Well, so this depends on how much you're going to spend, right? Um, if your average cost of sale is 50%, so you're going to spend 50% of the annual revenue on that, you just kind of have to back into it. Um, and we can get complicated with, you know, um, all types of different ways to do it. But if your profit margin is 25%, depends if you're going to look at a contribution margin or what you're going to look at, but let's just say that a net profit margin is 25%. If you're an experienced company and you have a, a lot of other customers, um, that's pretty doable. So, and you're going to spend 50% to pay to that rep. Well, if you keep that customer um, for, let's say four years, it's going to take a couple of years to get profitable on that customer because uh, 50%, you divide that by two is 25% each. And so you're going to need your, your first two years of your profit is going to go to pay off that sales rep. Okay, uh, this question is also regarding paying a sales rep. Um, we know that their pay is dependent on their sales. For a new sale employee, is it best to set up a draw against sales commission projection? That way you're giving them a small cash flow. 
Yeah, it's common to look to do that. It, it's it's harder when you have hundreds and hundreds of reps, but um, but you want to set it up to where they're going to you, they're going to. Um, for example, you have to have a housing set up for them. Um, these young college kids, they don't have any money, so you got to get it. It's kind of a risk. That's part of the risk is get the housing set up. You can put it in their name, so they kind of have some some liability there but they're not going to have much money. Most of these kids don't. Uh, the good ones don't because mom and dad aren't paying for them. So they're out there to go work hard. So you have to set it up to where, I mean, these guys are going to live on beans and rice and there's going to be a few weeks until they figure it out. So we like to do that, but you have to be careful. It just can't be a whole lot because you're dealing on a scale where you don't want to lose your shorts on people if they don't, if they're not committed. Okay. Um how does your tenure of inside sales reps compare to the rest of your workforce? And what have you done to increase that? Yeah, um, I don't know the exact percentage. I would say probably a third or maybe half, maybe even more are old door-to-door -door reps that don't want to have to go out and travel and don't knock door-to-door. -door and they, they, there's nothing better for a door-to-door -door rep to sit on a phone and, and they're just coming to him and he's selling them. It's so easy. And they just think it's the easiest thing in the world. So retiring door-to-door -door reps and putting them in that program is awesome and being able to pay them a lot. I mean, we have, we have sales reps that um, are selling over the phone. Um, I think some of our top reps sold over 2,000 reoccurring pest control accounts over the phone. And we're bringing in one to one and a half million dollars of revenue for one rep. And so it, it's a great job. And just finding the right type of person that can sit at a desk and answer phones all day is probably the hardest thing. Okay, uh, Ryan, this question's for you. Um, what's the best digital marketing technique to complement a door-to-door -door selling plan? I think it's a really good one. Mike brought it up earlier about how much paid advertising has gone up across the board. I think coupling your marketing strategy to align with organic so building out your website, building your culture, building your social, influencing decision-making based on your culture. That, that's huge, right? That's differentiating. And then invest in local service ads. So Google guaranteed, like you get approved for that. I know Mike could probably help you guys with that. We could help you with that. It's one of these things like that's going to differentiate you because Google's going to support 2,500 or more of your actual product itself and that service. So you're guaranteed by Google that they're going to do the right job and do right by you. So that's a great way to, if I was getting started or if I was making a pivot with my budget, I would say I would love to double down on more organic, both internally and either hiring an agency or working with a partner. And then also move my budget away from Google ads as much, which is just cutthroat. Like it's, it's high dollar amounts. The conversion is one of those things where it, it just depends but local service ads is a rotating cycle. So you're going to get in front of people. It's going to be a good way to differentiate yourself in that local area. So winning and losing on a local level would be both with content and your paid ads. Okay. And then Ryan, uh, what kind of traditional marketing works best to send with your door-to-door -door team as a leap behind or for those people who don't answer the door? I think going back to my, what Mike brought up earlier, a lot of people leave because they don't know the full range of services. I would just make sure that your lead behinds or your, your takeaways with door knocking or, or, or if they're not there, leaving something out, just going over the full breadth of your business and an elevator pitch and having that digitally um, is important, but having it in, in, a, in a hard copy version too. So just buttoning up your operation and know why you're doing what you're doing, what difference you from a competition because at the end of the day, there's not a lot of change. Like you guys are using very similar chemicals with your competition, but they are going to make a decision based on how you make them feel, not just what you tell them. And about how much of your marketing budget should you invest on more traditional marketing versus digital? So that's going to be, again, very much dialed in with the market. Right? Each market's going to be very different. And so if you look at someplace like Dallas or Vegas or LA, you're going to have a lot more competition at different levels. And so it would probably be very creative, like getting creative with your paid ads. So maybe you have um, general pests, those ads are through the roof cost per lead, but you could do a mosquito search and get the customer in on a mosquito 
piece of content and then upsell them later down the road to include general pests. So looking at how you spend all of your uh, investing your revenue back in your marketing strategy, it's going to be a case by case scenario, but make sure that when you're looking at it, top of mind should be how fast can I see an ROI with this decision and then stair step into what's the immediate mid and long-term solution. And that's going to change for each client, but generally it's going to be out the gate trying to see an ROI as fast as possible so it can fund the rest of your marketing efforts. Okay, thanks. Um, Mike, can you share some of the sales script that your sales reps use at the front door? Sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it's, it's, what's interesting is, is so much of it is nonverbal in your, 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 your confidence and how you're presenting yourself and what you look like. You have to have all of that, right? You got to look them in the eye and, and have your nonverbals right. But, and, and you've got to try and connect with that person. We think that it's, that you want to look, you don't want to look like a salesman. You really want to, you want to be more of a technician because that gives you credibility, especially if you're a younger person, you want to, you need as much credibility as possible. And so, so you want to look like a technician. Some of our guys will well wear belts and all kinds of different gadgets and pocket protectors and things to just really geek out to be the bug guy that brings you credibility. And you have to remember that when you have that shirt on and you're a bug guy that they do think you're the expert, even if your guy, it's his first day on the job. But, um, but what we're really going to do is we're just going to introduce ourselves with we um, a lot of times we'll say something like, did, did, did you did any did you guys talk? Did you guys hear about what's going on in the neighborhood? You know the answer to that question, right? Um, because and your pitch is going to change because the number one thing you got to remember is why do they buy? They're going to buy because the neighbors did it or are doing it. Well, if the neighbor isn't doing it, you can't use that. So we're going to go in neighborhoods where we have somebody already. So I'm going to have my list of customers and we're going to talk about those neighbors and that we have, we're doing the Romneys, we're doing the Smiths, we're doing the Arnells and, and everybody this time of year, you have to speak with confidence. Everybody this time of the year is seeing ants and we get carpenter ants on the back porch. We get those little sugar ants sometimes inside and which ones are you guys seeing the most, but but what we're really going to do is we're going to focus on any neighbors that we have. And if not, our sales pitch is going to be, did anybody, talk, did anybody talk to you yet about what we're doing? Well, we know the answer to that question. The answer is no. I've got my trucks out here in the neighborhood. Johnny is the technician that does your neighborhood. When he's done with the next home, we can come over and get you taken care of. The reason why we're doing so many people and that you, you got to understand that our guys will sell five, six, eight, 10, 12, or even sometimes 20 in a day. So the reason why we're doing it so many people is because we're doing a discounted rate. If you can get it done today, we'll do it for well over half price. Um, so something like that, there's a great inspection approach that we like. Um, we're doing people for well over half price. Let me just take a look around the outside of your home and do a quick inspection. And I can give you a quick price quote. But the reality is, is you want to, as soon as possible, um, see if they're an interest, if they're a qualified buyer. And so if they ask the price, you, you're going to continue. So you want to get to that. You want to get them to ask the price as soon as possible. Um, I might just leave it at that because we could go on forever and ever with sales training. All right. Thank you. Um, another question. I specialize mostly in ornamental pest control and my service is kind of limited to hotels. How do I expand to individual homes and broaden it to home pest control? Um, you know, uh, uh, Ryan, I don't know if you want to take a snap at that. Are we talking on the digital side or on the door to door? What, which side do you think we're, we're talking about? Um, is that one for me? Uh, it did not specify. Um, I would just say we've tried to get into other things, right? There was a while where we didn't do bed bugs and now we do. We, we didn't do a lot of termites and now we do a, lot, a ton of termites now. And so a lot of it is just slowly with your customers advertising new forms and new ways on digital and, and just other forms of marketing and, and learning and growing, getting references and referrals. Um, it's a little bit tough to break into a new market, same even with commercial. Um, 
it's difficult if you're residential or an ornament, ornamental or whatever you're doing and want to break into another industry. It just takes time. I would just say be patient and work into it and it, it will come. Okay, Ryan, did you have anything to add to that? I support, yeah, I support that in a second. It's just one of those things that across the board, oh. little things become big things. So I just, I wouldn't ever want us to glaze over um, what is the end of the funnel stuff when you're not talking about top of the funnel? So going back to core values and other elements, you can get over a lot of these things. Okay, thanks. Um, Mike, how do you keep from knocking on doors that are already under contract? Well, it's, you really probably can't. I mean, it, it's not awesome to knock on your own customer's door and try and sell them again. And that once in a while happens because you're not paying attention. But we have a great um, software that, that shows us the customer when they signed up and the name um, of the customer. So when we're in a neighborhood, one of our reps is in a neighborhood, even if he's never been there before, he can see on a Google Maps which homes are ours. So we know we're not going to knock on that house and try and sell them again. But but the reality is you're going to knock on a lot of doors that already have pest control with somebody else. And my, my, our, my personal philosophy on that is if they're happy with their service, it's just, let's just move on. But, but if they're not happy, then let's talk to them about what we can do to switch them over to a service that might provide a little bit more value they can be happy with. And so it, it literally is, again, a numbers game. You're going to knock on hundreds and hundreds of doors over the course of a week. And you're going to talk to a lot of people that are satisfied and you, you've got an option to try and beat them up and switch them over. And, and you can spend forever in a day trying to do that. And most of the time, we just think it's best to move forward and find people that, that don't have a service and, or, or that aren't happy. Do you have any data on about how long you keep the average customer? Yeah, it, it's, we, we run data like that, like crazy. And and one of the things that we found is the retention of a door-to-door -door versus the retention of a, of a digital sale. You know what's crazy? We used to think, uh, it just made sense that maybe um, one might be more than the other, but they're almost identical. Matter of fact, one year, one will be up like a tenth of a point and one will be down a tenth of a point. It's really amazing that they stay about the same. But here's what we found with all sales is that once they get past that initial 12 to 18 months, if you can keep them past 12 to 18 months, our attention is unbelievable. It's just not quite as good in that first 12 to 18 months because they've got to get to know you and they've got to put it in their budget and they've got to make sense of it and they've got to kind of buy into pest control. And so when what we focus on is that customer experience in the first that those, those th first two or three or four services to wow them enough to where they're never going to want to cancel but but what's great is the industry standard, as we like to say, is 2% a month, which is 24% a year is your attrition rate. Well, it's going to be a little bit higher than that or somewhere around that in your first 12 to 18 months. But if you can get them past then, then it's going to drop way down to where some you're looking at maybe a 12% a year, a 1% a month on, on customers that have been with you a long time. So um, you'd want to say somewhere between four to six years, you're going to keep your average customer, but it depends on what bucket of time they're in. Our old, we have customers that have been with us for 10 years. And so what's their value? They're going to hopefully stay with us for a long time. The older and the more mature you get as a company, the more that, that number changes. So if you're a startup company, it, it, it's just totally different than if you're an older company. And Jackie, our data backs what Mike said. So over the last 12 months, the data we did for that consumer report, 46% of folks are looking for something else, not because they're just satisfied, because they want a better deal. They want to see if the customer service experience is different. And then also in the younger generation of 18 to 34, they're also looking for novelty, something new. And you get them past that 12 to 18 month, you're going to see it change a lot more into, they're going to leave you because they moved away, or something like that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, that's all the time that we have for questions. Uh, so we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, thank you so much to Mike and Ryan for sharing your expertise. Do either of you have anything else you'd like to close with? Go ahead, Ryan. 
Yeah, I was going to say, it's been such an honor to sit here with Mike. I learned so much about the industry. Um, again, I've been here four years coming from a, a digital marketing background. This industry is so amazing, so wonderful. And, and Mike's a, a great case point of that. So it's just an honor to be part of this. And thank you so much for hosting at PCT. Thank you, Ryan. I would just I, I echo so many things that Ryan said. It's, it's an honor to be able to be here with you. And um, if we can ever help in any way, please let us know. We just want to be able to give back and grateful to meet Ryan and Jackie. And thanks for what PCT and, and Field Routes do. So it's a great company and um, really appreciate uh, being able to be here. Great. Um, and just to point out, uh, if you are interested in a demo from Field Routes, we have posted the link to that in the chat. So that's available to all attendees. And thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Jackie. See you guys. Thank you guys. Bye.